Section 4 of The Mad Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The blazing area widened as the purple surface was undermined and fell in. Burl watched the phenomenon without comprehension and even without thankfulness. He stood panting more and more slowly, breathing more and more easily, until the glow from the approaching flames reddened his skin and the acrid smoke made tears flow from his eyes. Then he retreated slowly, leaning on his club and looking back. The black wave of the army ants was sweeping into the fire, sweeping into the incredible heat of that carbonized material burning with an open flame. At last there were only the little bodies of stragglers from the great ant army, scurrying here and there over the ground their comrades had denuded of all living things. The bodies of the main army had vanished, burnt to crisp ashes in the furnace of the hills. There had been agony in that flame, dreadful agony such as no man would like to dwell upon. The insane courage of the ants, attacking with their horny jaws and burning masses of fungus, rolling over and over with a flaming missile clutched in their mandibles, sounding their shrill war cry while cries of agony came from them, blinded, their antenna burnt off, their lidless eyes scorched by the licking flames, yet going madly forward on flaming feet to attack, ever attack this unknown and unknowable enemy. Burl made his way slowly over the hills. Twice he saw small bodies of the army ants. They had passed between the widening surfaces their comrades had opened, and they were feeding voraciously upon the hills they trod on. Once Burl was spied, and a shrill war cry was sounded, but he moved on, and the ants were busily eating. A single ant rushed toward him. Burl brought down his club and a writhing body remained to be eaten later by its comrades when they came upon it. Again night fell. The skies grew red in the west, though the sun did not shine through the ever-present cloud bank. Darkness spread across the sky. Utter blackness fell over the whole mad world, save where the luminous mushrooms shed their pale light upon the ground, and fireflies the length of Burl's arm, shed their fitful gleams upon an earth of fungus growths and monstrous insects. Burl made his way across the range of mushroom hills, picking his path with his large blue eyes whose pupils expanded to great size. Slowly from the sky, now a drop and then a drop, now a drop and then a drop, the nightly rain that would continue until daybreak began. Burl found the ground hard beneath his feet. He listened keenly for sounds of danger. Something rustled heavily in a thicket of mushrooms a hundred yards away. There were sounds of preening and of delicate feet placed lightly here and there upon the ground. Then the throbbing beat of huge wings began suddenly, and a body took to the air. A fierce, downcoming current of air smote Burl and he looked upward in time to catch the outline of a huge body, a moth, as it passed above him. He turned to watch the line of its flight, and saw a strange glow in the sky behind him. The mushroom hills were still burning. He crouched beneath a squat toadstool and waited for the dawn, his club held tightly in his hands, and his ears alert for any sound of danger. The slow-dropping, sodden rain kept on. It fell with irregular, drum-like beats upon the tough top of the toadstool under which he had taken refuge. Slowly, slowly, the sodden rainfall continued. Drop by drop, all the night long, the warm pellets of liquid came from the sky. They boomed upon the hollow heads of the toadstools, and splashed into the streaming pools that lay festering all over the fungus-covered earth. 
and all the night long the great fires grew and spread in the mass of already half-carbonized mushroom. The flare at the horizon grew brighter and nearer. Burl, naked and hiding beneath a huge mushroom, watched it grow near him with wide eyes, wondering what this thing was. He had never seen a flame before. The overhanging clouds were brightened by the flames. Over a stretch at least a dozen miles in length, and from half a mile to three miles across, seething furnaces sent columns of dense smoke up to the roof of clouds, luminous from the glow below them, and spreading out and forming an intermediate layer below the cloud banks. It was like the glow of all the many lights of a vast city thrown against the sky, but the last great city had molded into fungus-covered rubbish thirty thousand years before. Like the flitting of airplanes above a populous city, too, was the flitting of fascinated creatures above the glow. Moths and great flying beetles, gigantic gnats and midges grown huge with the passing of time, they fluttered and danced the dance of death above the flames. As the fire grew nearer to Burl, he could see them. Colossal, delicately formed creatures swooped above the strange blaze. Moths with their riotously colored wings of thirty-foot spread beat the air with mighty strokes, and their huge eyes glowed like carbuncles as they stared with the frenzied gaze of intoxicated devotees into the glowing flames below them. Burl saw a great peacock moth soaring above the burning mushroom hills. Its wings were all of forty feet across, and fluttered like gigantic sails as the moth gazed down at the flaming furnace below. The separate flames had united now, and a single sheet of white-hot burning stuff spread across the country for miles, sending up its clouds of smoke, in which and through which the fascinated creatures flew. Feathery antennae of the finest lace spread out before the head of the peacock moth, and its body was softest, richest velvet. A ring of snow-white down marked where its head began, and the red glow from below smote on the maroon of its body with a strange effect. For one instant it was outlined clearly. Its eyes glowed more redly than any ruby's fire, and the great delicate wings were poised in flight. Burl caught the flash of the flames upon two great iridescent spots upon the widespread wings. Shining purple and vivid red, the glow of opal and the sheen of pearl, all the glory of chalcedony and chrysoprase formed a single wonder in the red glare of burning fungus. White smoke compassed the great moth all about, dimming the radiance of its gorgeous dress. Burl saw it dart straight into the thickest and brightest of the licking flames, flying madly, eagerly into the searing hellish heat as a willing, drunken sacrifice to the god of fire. Monster flying beetles with their horny wing cases stiffly stretched blundered above the reeking, smoking pyre. In the red light from before them they shone like burnished metal, and their clumsy bodies, with the spurred and fierce-toothed limbs, darted like so many grotesque meteors through the luminous haze of ascending smoke. Burl saw strange collisions and still stranger meetings. Male and female flying creatures circled and spun in the glare, dancing their dance of love and death in the wild radiance from the funeral pyre of the purple hills. They mounted higher than Burl could see, drunk with the ecstasy of living, then descended to plunge headlong to death in the roaring fires beneath them. From every side the creatures came. Moths of brightest yellow with soft and furry bodies palpitant with life flew madly into the column of light that reached to the overhanging clouds. Then moths of deepest black with gruesome symbols upon their wings came swiftly to dance, like motes in a bath of sunlight above the glow. And Burl sat crouched beneath an overshadowing toadstool and watched. 
The perpetual, slow, sodden raindrops fell. A continual faint hissing penetrated the sound of the fire, the raindrops being turned to steam. The air was alive with flying things. From far away, Burl heard a strange, deep bass muttering. He did not know the cause, but there was a vast swamp, of the existence of which he was ignorant, some ten or fifteen miles away, and the chorus of insect-eating giant frogs reached his ears even at that distance. The night wore on, while the flying creatures above the fire danced and died, their numbers ever recruited by fresh arrivals. Burl sat tensely still, his wide eyes watching everything, his mind groping for an explanation of what he saw. At last the sky grew dimly gray, then brighter, and day came on. The flames of the burning hills grew faint as the fire died down, and after a long time Burl crept from his hiding place and stood erect. A hundred yards from where he was, a straight wall of smoke rose from the still smoldering fungus, and Burl could see it stretching for miles in either direction. He turned to continue on his way and saw the remains of one of the tragedies of the night. A huge moth had flown into the flames, been horribly scorched, and floundered out again. Had it been able to fly, it would have returned to its devouring deity, but now it lay immovable upon the ground, its antenna seared hopelessly, one beautiful delicate wing burned in gaping holes its eyes dimmed by flame, and its exquisitely tapering limbs broken and crushed by the force with which it had struck the ground. It lay helpless upon the earth, only the stumps of its antenna moving restlessly, and its abdomen pulsating slowly as it drew pain-racked breaths. Burl drew near and picked up a stone. He moved on presently, a velvet cloak cast over his shoulders, gleaming with all the colors of the rainbow. A gorgeous mass of soft blue moth fur was about his middle, and he had bound upon his forehead two yard-long golden fragments of the moth's magnificent antenna. He strode on, slowly, clad as no man had been clad in all the ages. After a little he secured a spear and took up his journey to Saya looking like a prince of Ind upon a bridal journey, though no mere prince ever wore such raiment in days of greatest glory. For many long miles Burl threaded his way through a single forest of thin-stocked toadstools. They towered three man-heights high, and all about their bases were streaks and splashes of the rusts and molds that preyed upon them. Twice Burl came to open glades, wherein open, bubbling pools of green slime festered in corruption, and once he hid himself fearfully, as a monster scarabius beetle lumbered within three yards of him, moving heavily onward with a clanking of limbs as of some mighty machine. Burl saw the mighty armor and the inward curving jaws of the creature, and envied him his weapons. The time was not yet come, however, when Burl would smile at the great insect and hunt him for the juicy flesh contained in those armored limbs. Burl was still a savage, still ignorant, still timid. His principal advance had been that whereas he had fled without reasoning, he now paused to see if he need flee. In his hands, he bore a long, sharp-pointed chitinous spear. It had been the weapon of a huge, unnamed flying insect, scorched to death in the burning of the purple hills, which had floundered out of the flames to die. Burl had worked for an hour before being able to detach the weapon he coveted. It was as long and longer than Burl himself. He was a strange sight, moving slowly and cautiously through the shadowed lanes of the mushroom forest. A cloak of delicate velvet in which all the colors of the rainbow played in iridescent beauty hung from his shoulders. 
A mass of soft and beautiful moth fur was about his middle, and in the strip of sinew about his waist the fiercely toothed limb of a fighting beetle was thrust carelessly. He had, bound to his forehead, twin stalks of a great moth's feathery golden antenna. Against the play of color that came from his borrowed plumage, his pink skin showed in odd contrast. He looked like some proud knight walking slowly through the gardens of a goblin's castle. But he was still a fearful creature, no more than the monstrous creatures about him save in the possession of latent intelligence. He was weak, and therein lay his greatest promise. A hundred thousand years before him, his ancestors had been forced by lack of claws and fangs to develop brains. Burl was sunk as low as they had been, but he had to combat more horrifying enemies, more inexorable threatenings, and many times more crafty assailants. His ancestors had invented knives and spears and flying missiles. The creatures about Burl had knives and spears a thousand times more deadly than the weapons that had made his ancestors masters of the woods and forests. Burl was in comparison vastly more weak than his forebears had been, and it was that weakness that in times to come would lead him and those who followed him to heights his ancestors had never known. But now... He heard a discordant, deep bass bellow coming from a spot not twenty yards away. In a flash of panic, he darted behind a clump of mushrooms and hid himself, panting in sheer terror. He waited for an instant in frozen fear, motionless and tense. His wide blue eyes were glassy. The bellow came again, but this time with a querulous note. Burl heard a crashing and plunging, as of some creature caught in a snare. A mushroom fell with a brittle snapping, and the brungy thud as it fell to the ground was followed by a tremendous commotion. Something was fighting desperately against something else, but Burl did not know what creature or creatures might be in combat. He waited for a long time, and the noise gradually died away. Presently Burl's breath came more slowly, and his courage returned. He stole from his hiding place, and would have made away, but something held him back. Instead of creeping from the scene, he crept cautiously over toward the source of the noise. He peered between two cream-colored toadstool stalks, and saw the cause of the noise. A wide, funnel-shaped snare of silk was spread out before him, some twenty yards across and as many deep. The individual threads could be plainly seen, but in the mass it seemed a fabric of sheerest, finest texture. Held up by the small mushrooms, it was anchored to the ground below and drew away to a tiny point through which a hole gave on some yet unknown recess and all the space of the wide snare was hung with threads, fine, twisted threads no more than half the thickness of Burl's finger. This was the trap of a labyrinth spider. Not one of the interlacing threads was strong enough to hold the feeblest of prey, but the threads were there by thousands. A great cricket had become entangled in the maze of sticky lines. Its limbs thrashed out, smashing the snare lines at every stroke, but at every stroke meeting and becoming entangled with a dozen more. It thrashed about mightily, emitting at intervals the horrible deep bass cry that the chirping voice of the cricket had become with its increase in size. Burl breathed more easily and watched with a fascinated curiosity. Mere death, even tragic death, as among insects, held no great interest for him. It was a matter of such common and matter-of-fact occurrence that he was not greatly stirred. But a spider and his prey was another matter. 
There were few insects that deliberately sought man. Most insects have their allotted victims, and will touch no others, but spiders have a terrifying impartiality. One great beetle devouring another was a matter of indifference to Burl. A spider devouring some luckless insect was but an example of what might happen to him. He watched alertly, his gaze traveling from the enmeshed cricket to the strange orifice at the rear of the funnel-shaped snare. The opening darkened. Two shining, glistening eyes had been watching from the rear of the funnel. It drew itself into a tunnel there, in which the spider had been waiting. Now it swung out lightly and came toward the cricket. It was a gray spider, Angelina labyrinthica, with twin black ribbons upon its thorax, next the head, and with two stripes of curiously speckled brown and white upon its abdomen. Burl saw, too, two curious appendages, like a tail. It came blindly out of its tunnel-like hiding place and approached the cricket. The cricket was struggling only feebly now, and the cries it uttered were but feeble, because of the confining threads that fettered its limbs. Burl saw the spider throw itself upon the cricket and saw the final, convulsive shudder of the insect as the spider's fangs pierced its tough armor. The sting lasted a long time and finally Burl saw that the spider was really feeding. All the succulent juices of the now-dead cricket were being sucked from its body by the spider. It had stung the cricket upon the haunch, and presently it went to the other leg and drained that, too, by means of its powerful internal suction pump. When the second haunch had been sucked dry, the spider pawed the lifeless creature for a few moments and left it. Food was plentiful, and the spider could afford to be dainty in its feeding. The two choicest tidbits had been consumed. The remainder could be discarded. A sudden thought came to Burl and quite took his breath away. For a second his knees knocked together in self-induced panic. He watched the gray spider carefully, with growing determination in his eyes. He, Burl, had killed a hunting spider upon the red clay cliff. True, the killing had been an accident, and had nearly cost him his own life a few minutes later in the web spider's snare, but he had killed a spider, and of the most deadly kind. Now a great ambition was growing in Burl's heart. His tribe had always feared spiders too much to know much of their habits, but they knew one or two things. The most important was that the snare spiders never left their lairs to hunt. Never. Burl was about to make a daring application of that knowledge. He drew back from the white and shining snare and crept softly to the rear. The fabric gathered itself into a point and then continued for some twenty feet as a tunnel in which the spider waited while dreaming of its last meal and waiting for the next victim to become entangled in the labyrinth in front. Burl made his way to a point where the tunnel was no more than ten feet away and waited. Presently, through the interstices of the silk, he saw the gray bulk of the spider. It had left the exhausted body of the cricket and returned to its resting place. It settled itself carefully upon the soft walls of the tunnel, with its shining eyes fixed upon the tortuous threads of its trap. Burl's hair was standing straight up upon his head from sheer fright, but he was the slave of an idea. He drew near and poised his spear, his new and sharp spear, taken from the body of an unknown flying creature killed by the burning purple hills. Burl raised the spear and aimed its sharp and deadly point at the thick gray bulk he could see dimly through the threads of the tunnel. He thrust at home with all his strength and ran away at the top of his speed, glassy-eyed from terror. 
a long time later he ventured near again, his heart in his mouth, ready to flee at the slightest sound. All was still. Burl had missed the horrible convulsions of the wounded spider, had not heard the frightful gnashings of its fangs as it tore at the piercing weapon, had not seen the silken threads of the tunnel ripped as the spider, hurt to death, had struggled with insane strength to free itself. He came back beneath the overshadowing toadstools, stepping quietly and cautiously to find a great rent in the silken tunnel, to find the great gray bulk lifeless and still, half fallen through the opening the spear had first made. A little puddle of evil-smelling liquid lay upon the ground below the body, and from time to time a droplet fell from the spear into the puddle with a curious splash. Burl looked at what he had done, saw the dead body of the creature he had slain, saw the ferocious mandibles and the keen and deadly fangs. The dead eyes of the creature still stared at him malignantly, and the hairy legs were still braced as if further to enlarge the gaping hole through which it had partly fallen. Exultation filled Burl's heart. His tribe had been but furtive vermin for thousands of years, fleeing from the mighty insects, hiding from them, and if overtaken but waiting helplessly for death, screaming shrilly in terror. He, Burl, had turned the tables. He had slain one of the enemies of his tribe. His breast expanded. Always his tribesmen went quietly and fearfully, making no sound. But a sudden exultant yell burst from Burl's lips, the first hunting cry from the lips of a man in three hundred centuries. The next second his pulse nearly stopped in sheer panic at having made such a noise. He listened fearfully, but there was no sound. He drew near his prey and carefully withdrew his spear. The viscid liquid made it slimy and slippery, and he had to wipe it dry against a leathery toadstool. Then Burl had to conquer his illogical fear again before daring to touch the creature he had slain. He moved off presently, with the belly of the spider upon his back and two of the hairy legs over his shoulders. The other limbs of the monster hung limp and trailed upon the ground. Burl was now a still more curious sight as a gaily colored object with a cloak shining in iridescent colors, the golden antenna of a great moth rising from his forehead, and the hideous bulk of a gray spider for a burden. He moved through the thin-stalked mushroom forest, and because of the thing he carried, all creatures fled before him. They did not fear man, their instinct was slow-moving. But during all the millions of years that insects have existed, there have existed spiders to prey upon them. So Burl moved on in solemn state, a brightly clad man bent beneath the weight of a huge and horrible monster. He came upon a valley full of torn and blackened mushrooms. There was not a single yellow top among them. Every one had been infested with tiny maggots, which had liquefied the tough meat of the mushroom and caused it to drip to the ground below. And all the liquid had gathered in a golden pool in the center of the small depression. Burl heard a loud humming and buzzing before he topped the rise that opened the valley for his inspection. He stopped a moment and looked down. A golden red lake its center reflecting the hazy sky overhead. All about, blackened mushrooms, seeming to have been charred and burned by a fierce flame. A slow-flowing golden brooklet trickled slowly over a rocky ledge into the larger pool. And all about the edges of the golden lake, in ranks and rows, by hundreds, thousands, and by millions, were ranged the green-gold shining bodies of great flies. They were small as compared with the other insects. 
they had increased in size but a fraction of the amount that the bees, for example, had increased. But it was due to an imperative necessity of their race. The flesh flies laid their eggs by hundreds in decaying carcasses. The others laid their eggs by hundreds in the mushrooms. To feed the maggots that would hatch, a relatively great quantity of food was needed. Therefore, the flies must remain comparatively small, or the body of a single grasshopper, say, would furnish food for but two or three grubs instead of the hundreds it must support. Burl stared down at the golden pool. Blue bottles, green bottles, and all the flies of metallic luster were gathered at the Lucullan feast of corruption. Their buzzing as they darted above the odorous pool of golden liquid made the sound Burl had heard. Their bodies flashed and glittered as they darted back and forth, seeking a place to alight and join in the orgy. Those which clustered about the banks of the pool were still as if carved from metal. Their huge red eyes glowed, and their bodies shone with an obscene fatness. Flies are the most disgusting of all insects. Burl watched them a moment, watched the interlacing streams of light as they buzzed eagerly above the pool, seeking a place at the festive board. A drumming roar sounded in the air. A golden speck appeared in the sky a slender, needle-like body with transparent, shining wings and two huge eyes. It grew nearer and became a dragonfly, twenty feet and more in length, its body shimmering purest gold. It poised itself above the pool and then darted down. Its jaws snapped viciously and repeatedly, and at each snapping the glittering body of a fly vanished. A second dragonfly appeared, its body of vivid purple, and a third. They swooped and rushed above the golden pool, snapping in mid-air, turning their abrupt angular turns, creatures of incredible ferocity and beauty. At the moment they were nothing more or less than slaughtering machines. They darted here and there, their many-faceted eyes burning with bloodlust. In that mass of buzzing flies, even the most voracious appetite must be sated. But the dragonflies kept on. Beautiful, slender, graceful creatures, they dashed here and there above the pond like avenging fiends, or the mythical dragons for which they had been named. Only a few miles farther on, Burl came upon a familiar landmark. He knew it well but from a safe distance, as always. A mass of rock had heaved itself up from the nearly level plain over which he was traveling, and formed an outjutting cliff. At one point the rock overhung a sheer drop, making an inverted ledge, a roof over nothingness, which had been preempted by a hairy creature and made into a fairy-like dwelling. A white hemisphere clung tenaciously to the rock above, and long cables anchored it firmly. Burl knew the place as one to be fearfully avoided. A clotho spider, clotho durandi, L-A-T-R, had built itself a nest there, from which it emerged to hunt the unwary. Within that half-globe there was a monster, resting upon a cushion of softest silk, but if one went too near, one of the little inverted arches, seemingly firmly closed by a wall of silk, would open and a creature out of a dream of hell emerge to run with fiendish agility toward its prey. Surely Burl knew the place. Hung upon the outer walls of the silken palace were stones and tiny boulders, discarded fragments of former meals, and the gutted armor from limbs of ancient prey. But what caused Burl to know the place most surely and most terribly was another decoration that dangled from the castle of this insect ogre. This was the shrunken, desiccated figure of a man, all its juices extracted and the life gone. 
the death of that man had saved Burl's life two years before. They had been together, seeking a new source of edible mushrooms for food. The clotho spider was a hunter, not a spinner of snares. It sprang suddenly from behind a great puffball, and the two men froze in terror. Then it came swiftly forward and deliberately chose its victim. Burl had escaped when the other man was seized. Now he looked meditatively at the hiding place of his ancient enemy. Some day... But now he passed on. He went past the thicket in which the great moths hid during the day, and past the pool, a turgid thing of slime and yeast, in which a monster water snake lurked. He penetrated the little wood of the shining mushrooms that gave out light at night, and the shadowed place where the truffle-hunting beetles went chirping thunderously during the dark hours. And then he saw Saya. He caught a flash of pink skin vanishing behind the thick stalk of a squat toadstool and ran forward, calling her name. She appeared and saw the figure with the horrible bulk of the spider upon its back. She cried out in horror, and Burl understood. He let his burden fall, and then went swiftly toward her. They met. Saya waited timidly until she saw who this man was, and then astonishment went over her face. Gorgeously attired, in an iridescent cloak from the whole wing of a great moth, with a strip of softest fur from a night-flying creature about his middle, with golden feathery antenna bound upon his forehead, and a fierce spear in his hands, this was not the burl she had known. But then he moved slowly toward her, filled with a fierce delight at seeing her again, thrilling with joy at the slender gracefulness of her form, and the dark richness of her tangled hair. He held out his hands and touched her shyly. Then, manlike, he began to babble excitedly of the things that had happened to him, and dragged her toward his great victim, the gray-bellied spider. Saya trembled when she saw the furry bulk lying upon the ground, and would have fled when Burl advanced and took it upon his back. Then something of the pride that filled him came vicariously to her. She smiled a flashing smile and Burl stopped short in his excited explanation. He was suddenly tongue-tied. His eyes became pleading and soft. He laid the huge spider at her feet and spread out his hands imploringly. Thirty thousand years of savagery had not lessened the femininity in Saya. She became aware that Burl was her slave, that these wonderful things he wore and had done were as nothing if she did not approve. She drew away, saw the misery in Burl's face, and abruptly ran into his arms and clung to him, laughing happily. And quite suddenly Burl saw with extreme clarity that all these things he had done, even the slaying of a great spider, were of no importance whatever beside this most wonderful thing that had just happened and told Saya so quite humbly, but holding her very close to him as he did so. And so Burl came back to his tribe. He had left it nearly naked, but with a wisp of moth wing twisted about his middle, a timid, fearful, trembling creature. He returned in triumph, walking slowly and fearlessly down a broad lane of golden mushrooms toward the hiding place of his people. Upon his shoulders was draped a great and many-colored cloak made from the whole of a moth's wing. Soft fur was about his middle. A spear was in his hand and a fierce club at his waist. He and Saya bore between them the dead body of a huge spider, aforetime the dread of the pink-skinned, naked men. But to Burl, the most important thing of all was that Saya walked beside him openly, acknowledging him before all the tribe. 
End of section four. Recording by Roger Moline. End of The Mad Planet by Murray Leinster.